I love the fact uh, that when he got, uh, I love that when he got to the part in his uh, testimony, I feel like this isn't working. Is the mic muted? I gotta turn it off. Let me try it this way. It works better the other way. <laughs> I got it. I love, I love that when he got to the part of the testimony where the doctor said he would never run, he put down the microphone and ran around the auditorium. And that just, that just made me happy. It made my heart happy. You know, I think we always have to remember, we have, we have wonderful, wonderful uh, medical people that everybody's doing the best they can, really doing the best they can, trying to, to help other people. But the, the great physician has the final word. Okay? He always has the final word. And um, I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that, that, that um, our lives are really in his hands. Everybody else is just instruments, okay? Instruments, everybody is trying to add positive help and benefits to our lives, but our, our lives are in the hands of Jesus. Um, and um, I'm going to go to Psalm 107 this morning. Now, I'm, I'm titled today's message, Amazing Grace. And um, because I think it, his, God's grace is all through this psalm. It's one of my favorite psalms. And um, let's pray as we look at this. Father, I just thank you for the, the testimony of that young boy and uh, the song that you gave Matthew West, minister and proclaim your, your grace, your healing blessings. I thank you, Father, that you, we are under your authority. We are in your family. We are under your leadership. That you are in our lives, involved in our lives, living in us, and you have the final word over our lives. And we just pray, because there's so many of us, we're seeking miracles, we're seeking healing, we're seeking blessings. And we're wanting to be closer to you, Father. And we just ask you to bring your kingdom and release those blessings for each one. Continuing to lift up Sherry in, in this battle with cancer. And just pray, God, that you would do a, a, a creative miracle and restore her cells to health. And Father, I pray, i got to lift up my daughter and, and some health problems she's having related to her Lyme disease. And just ask you, God, that you would bring that healing that we've sought for so many years. But God, you are good. You're always blessing her. She's full of joy. But God, we want more because it's, it's so available through Christ. We ask you for it. Healing blessings and miracles in our lives. And that we would exalt Jesus in all things. Whether things are going the way we want them to or not. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Psalm 107. <clears throat> I'm going to take this in, I mean, chunks and just kind of talk about it in pieces as we go through it. But you're going to recognize a pattern um, in this psalm, uh, beginning with giving thanks for God's loving kindness in His presence. And, and then there's a series of examples of how God is involved in the affairs of people. Um, even in their rebellion, how he steps in when they're, when they're willing to turn back to him. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Everybody say, God is good all the time. Amen. His loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. You realize that's us. We are the, the redeemed of the Lord. And we have been redeemed from the hand of the adversary. From the clutches of the devil. And we've been set free from the, the, the destructiveness of sin. And we've been brought in his glorious family. So he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What? That he is good. And his loving kindness is everlasting. Those of us who has been redeemed from the hand of the adversary. And he says, he gathered from the lands from east and west, um, yeah, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Why was it so hard for me to say east, west, north, and south? <laughs> Just natural. Okay. It says in verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness, in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. I want you to notice that these words here, it's just, I think it's describing life for, for a group of people that, that they're going through a, a dry season. 
They're, they're wandering through this a de a desert region and it doesn't say they've done anything wrong. They're just, this is what they're experiencing. They're hungry, they're thirsty, their souls fainting within them. It, it, could, it does kind of remind me of when the, the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness as well. It says, but this is how the people responded when they were in this wilderness period in their life, this difficult time. It says, verse 6, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them. This is God's response. They called out to him in the midst of their trouble. They asked for his help. And God responds in his incredible grace. says he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. This passage is very personal to me because year, years ago when we were in Kansas and I was um, looking for a, a full-time church position, having finished school, and I was frustrated. Um, how many of you know that the, the church can be more restricting than Jesus? And, uh, and, and, and it was rough. I sent all these resumes out and, and, um, and, and I didn't qualify. Okay, because all kinds of things, but one of the things was I hadn't been married long enough. We were newly married. Another church said, well, we're looking for somebody that's married in about 40 years, you know, 30s and 40s or something like that. And we want, we're hoping that they have a couple of kids so that they have life experience. And I, I think I actually told the guy, do you realize the Apostle Paul would not have qualified to lead your church? <laughs> it was frustrating. I felt a little bad because I kind of chewed him out a little bit, but, but um, it, it's funny, though that petty stuff that people set up, it's, God is so much bigger than it. It's amazing how he makes a way, but it was during that season, I was discouraged, I was praying, and I don't remember how it happened, but this psalm stood out to me, and the word that really jumped out at my heart, I know the context, but God used it for me, for, for that moment. And it was, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. And he led us to Indiana. He led us to Indiana. And ultimately to the Fishers. So much so that when we, we moved to Fishers and, and, and we began building a house and a church opened in, in Worthington, and we just kept the house. We just kept the house. And, and uh, went and ministered in Worthington for about a year and a half. And then a church opened up just a couple miles from our house. And we went there and we served for 23 years. But it was interesting that he'd actually led us to Fishers. And we actually had the house there. And just how he orchestrated things is amazing. He's always waiting for his children to talk to him. If we would just understand and he is such a loving father, and we are his children, and he wants us to communicate with him. He wants us to talk to him. He wants to show his grace. He delights in showing his presence. I really believe he delights in contradicting the negative garbage that people speak over one another and showing his presence, just like the little boy. Why tell the boy he's never going to run again? You know? Why tell him he's never going to walk? Well, I'll tell you why, because the devil seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, and he has the last word. He has the last word. So, we give thanks to God for his loving kindness and his wonders to the sons of man. It says in verse 9, he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he is filled with what is good. Yeah. Then we get into a new set of people. So you got the people that... I think they're just experiencing life. They're having a hard time. They're discouraged. They're distressed. They call out to God, and he breaks through. Now we go into a rebellious group, okay? And it says in verse 10, There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God, okay? These are people who rebelled against the words of God and were experienced consequences, for their decisions, and they spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, 
because they rebelled against him, because they spurned his counsel, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was none to help. They cried out to the Lord, and here it is. So they're in misery, they rebelled against God, but they cry out to God in, in their distress. It says they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Remember, this pattern was all throughout Israel's history so many times. You know, he would send judges, and they would set the people free, and the people would follow the Lord during the life of that particular judge. And then they would turn away from God, and he would send the enemies, and the enemies would defeat them. And, 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 and they would spend a period, period of time under occupation of, of another nation. And, and then finally they would cry out to the Lord, and he would, it's amazing, this is amazing grace, how willing God was to again and again and again come back and forgive. Because he's a father. Now we're his children. Now when you have kids, many of you, most of you probably have kids, and, and they goof up and they disappoint you, and, and but when they come back and they repent and they're apologetic and wonder, you know, with, with, who among us would say, well, you're not my kid anymore, you know? You know, that's not how we respond. Not for full of love Jesus. <laughs> that's not how we respond. We welcome them with love and acceptance. And the Father, it just longs for people to come and return to Him. There's a passage, I'm going to throw this in right now, from Lamentations. As long as it's still in my Bible. Yep, it is. Three, Lamentations 3, verse 33. Real easy to remember, 333. Verse 31 says, The Lord will not reject forever, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. But I love this verse 33. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. It's not his desire to discipline. It really isn't his desire to do that. He so willingly restores people when they come to him in repentance and in faith. And, and I remind people this all the time because I encounter so many people that have been years away from God and now they're in distress and God feels so distant and that, that old song, he's only a prayer away and I always tell him he's right here in the room I brought him in here with me <laughs> he's right here in the room, okay and he's listening to you and he's hearing your heart cry that you, you miss him and that you want that relationship with him and he will receive you and it begins with a prayer it begins with the prayer. And this is this message of God's amazing grace is throughout this particular psalm where they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. It says, He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His love and kindness and His wonders to the sons of men. For He has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. That theme of giving thanks to the Lord, it, it repeats again and again and again. Verse 17. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. So again, we have people that are rebellious and, and living simple lives, living outside of the heart of God. And this is appears to be physical illness, okay? It says their soul abhorred all kinds of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. But then, it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. I love this, this idea that, okay, they, they, they've turned away from God, they become sick, they become physically ill. I'm sure spiritually they're sick as well. It says they're pouring all kinds of food, but then they cry out to him, and he saves them. But it says more, it says, he sent his word and healed them. I think Wayne prayed something like that this morning. Send forth your word. He sent his word and healed them. And isn't that what he did for us? He sent his word and he healed us. 
John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have beheld His glory, the glory as of the only Son of the Father. He sent His Word and He healed us. He healed us of our spiritual illnesses. And He continually has healed us of, of physical illnesses throughout our lives. Over and over and over again. How many of us laid in bed sick with the flu or something and say, oh God, help me, oh God, help me. <laughs> you know, you really appreciate your health when you're sick, don't you? You appreciate, you appreciate what you're missing in the moment. And he's, come bro he's broken through for us so many times. He's so faithful, he's so good, but he sent his word, when his word goes forth, it creates, it makes things new. The, all of the creation responds to his word. And as from the very beginning, in Genesis 1, when he spoke the word, it was created. And our response is to give thanks for his loving kindness, his wonders, to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, to testify or to tell of his works with joyful singing, to testify. It's powerful that this young, this young boy that we watch the testimony of in Matthew West, um, the song that he wrote, that he's sharing his testimony because when you share your testimony, it creates faith in other people. And there's a possibilities that are just huge for God doing another miracle in somebody else's life. For somebody to watch that video and all of a sudden a spark of hope to come up. For them to watch that and suddenly say, my goodness, there is a God. There is a God. Power of testimony. And we are commanded to give thanks to declare his sacrifices, and to tell of his works with joyful singing, which is what we do when we sing on Sundays. Most the songs we're singing about are praising him, but so many of them are just simply telling of the incredible things that he's done for us. Then we have verse 23. I love this one because it reminds me of, of the disciples on the boat with Jesus when he stood up in the storm and said, Peace be still, and everything grew calm. The power of the Lord over all nature and the storms of life. Listen to this. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Right, these sailors were convinced they were, they were going to not make it. If you read in Acts, the book of Acts, towards the end, I think it's chapter 27, um, it, it's kind of 27, 28 combined, where Paul's on this ship and for 14 days and 14 nights. At one point in despair, they literally didn't think they were going to make it. But ultimately, God sent an angel to reassure them that they were going to get safely to land and and uh, I'll let you read that story, you know, but God brought them through that. And these men were at their wit's end. And it says, verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And that was the key. They were at their wit's end until they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still. There's that peace be still. Cause the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet, so he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. He's saying, Declare what God has done in the midst of all the people that are gathered to worship God. Tell the leaders of Israel, tell the leaders of the church the wonderful things that God has done. He wants them to proclaim, he wants us to proclaim the good things he has done in our life, to testify. He receives glory from that and it plants seeds of hope and faith in people that hear it. Now this story is wonderful. I, I was reading part of, I have a book um, on John Newton. John Newton, I think it's called The Angry Sailor. I forgot to look at the title, but I think it's called The Angry Sailor. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. Okay, the song that we sang today. And, and I was remembering some stuff from the book, and so I pulled it up and read through a few chapters of it, actually last night, 
I was up kind of late reading John Newton, but it was great. I enjoyed so much of it. But his story is absolutely incredible because he was he was a, a captain of a ship, and he was a slave trader, and he was wicked. He says himself, he called himself, ultimately he compared himself to the Apostle Paul as the chief of sinners. He saw himself that way. And um, just wicked. And, but God had a plan for his life. And God spared him miraculously again and again and again. And on one of, the, one of his cruises um, out on the ocean, a massive storm came up. People were being swept overboard into the ocean. It was, they, the, the ship was leaking all over the place. They were taking their clothes off and plugging the holes in the ships and then nailing boards down over the, the, the clothes to try to keep the ship from sinking. And he called out to the Lord in repentance. And at, it said, I need you. you know, he called out to Jesus and said, I need you and we need your help or we're going to perish. And miraculously, the storm calmed down. It's an amazing story. The storm calmed down. And I love what happened later because God has such a way of revealing his glory to us. He said the storm grew, grew, uh, grew calm. They made it into their, their destination. I think it was England that they were headed into. They landed in the port. They got off the ship. And all of a sudden, a massive wind started battering the, the, the area, just a storm came up, started battering, and the ship sunk while they watched it go down. Is that God? <laughs> and it's like signing, signing the testimony. Yes, the, this was me, in case there was any question. But John Newton was stubborn. He was a little bit slow um, about some things. And one of them was the slave trade. He just wasn't sure. He wasn't sure that it was wrong. So he's praying to God and asking whether he should do it. He doesn't hear anything from God. So he tells his wife that he's going to go back on the ship to get more slaves because I've been praying and God's not been telling me that it's wrong. So I think it's okay. And two, a couple days before the ship is a sail, he suddenly gets terribly ill. Okay. And the doctor told him, you can't go out on a ship. So he didn't go out on a ship. He later found out that the ship that he was a sail on went out and it sunk while it was out at sea. Everybody paid in prayer should have been on it. He had another example of the amazing loving kindness and grace for him. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. That, by the way, that last experience was the one that convinced him that the slave trading was wrong in God's eyes. And he repented of that and became a person to defend their freedom. John, John Newton, we know Amazing Grace. But you may not know that he wrote over 300 hymns. Over 300 hymns. I mean, God had a plan for this man. He wanted him to testify. Amazing grace. Can you imagine if he had perished at sea, unless God had raised somebody else up to write the hymn, we would not have that hymn. And that's a hymn that's known around the world in so many languages. Such a powerful testimony. But he lived this. He lived this experience with the Lord. And I, and I love his testimony. Let me see where we're at. There's just a little bit more here. Just kind of wrap, wrap this up. I'm in the wrong chapter. I wonder why I was lost. <laughs> okay, now it's just talking about God. And, and we have, essentially, there's four different testimonies that, it, that it's speaking of. It's, it's talking about the people wandering through the wilderness, going through hardships, in life, it's talking about the, the, the people that have rebelled and are in prison and misery and in chains. It's talking about the people that are sick and it, because of the rebellion and they need his healing. And now it's talking about the sailors and, and what they encountered at sea. But notice, this is in the Old Testament. This is before Jesus even came. But the love of God has always been. He has always been a God of love. Jesus is from eternity. People make the mistake of thinking that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, and he isn't. Jesus wouldn't have even came if it weren't for the fact that he was loved from eternity. And it was part of God's plan. So it's all part of what he was doing. But it says, verse 33, he changes rivers into wilderness, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of those who dwell in it. 
So hardships come to the people because of wickedness, because of rebellion. Friends, sicknesses come because of wickedness and rebellion. Plagues come because of wickedness and rebellion. But there's hope in Christ. There's hope in Christ. He says in the verse 35, he changes the wilderness into a pool of water, dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city. And sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly. He does not let their cattle decrease. So he, he turns around and he blesses. He causes the sun to rise on the righteous and the unrighteous. He causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteousness. He displays his love for the entire world. I'm just going to finish it. It's just a few more verses here. It says, When they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes, makes them wander in pathless ways. But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. Who is wise? This is, this is the last verse, verse 43. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Amen. Amazing. I read a really amazing story. Back in the 1500s, I think it said 1517, there was a plague that struck an area. And there was a preacher, his name is escaping me right now, but there was a preacher that went to that area to proclaim the word of God. And he said there was a gate to the city. And on one side of the gate were the people that had the plague and were perishing in the plague. On the other side were the people that were whole. And he stood at the gate and he preached. And they said that when he got done preaching the, the love of God, the, the, the truth about what Christ has done, that the, many of the people that were on the side of the gate that had the plague were filled with so much hope. They were filled with so much hope because all of a sudden they realized, if I don't make it through this plague, I'll go to be with Jesus completely transformed, took what was a horrible plague, a horrible, sad, destructive thing, and filled people with the possibilities, the anticipation, I could be with Jesus today. I, I read, who was the, oh my gosh, Amy Carmichael. I think it was Amy Carmichael that, that I read years ago. She has popped in my head, and she was lame, if I remember correctly. I think she was, she was a bedroom. She had a lot of health issues. And, and this is off the top of my head, but I remember there was somebody, I don't know if it was her, I think it was somebody else that told them that if I get up too fast, the doctor said my heart will quit and I'll die. And I think it was Amy talking to her. He said, however do you resist the temptation? <laughs> <laughs> however do you resist the temptation? <laughs> uh, the way I am with my dreams, I probably kill myself in my sleep just by hopping out of bed during one of my little dreams. Like, woo! <laughs> Jesus. Okay. <laughs> oh, God's grace is good. He's with us all the time. He's with us all the time. Let's let's pray. Father, I thank you for your loving kindness, your amazing grace. That whatever storms we encounter in this life, and this world is in turmoil at so many levels. And, and you said at the end times, the love of most would grow cold. But in this room, you have people that have lifted up their eyes because they know that redemption is drawing near. They know that you sit enthroned and we belong to you. We will keep our eyes fixed on you. We pray your Holy Spirit would baptize us so powerfully and beautifully in your presence that we would walk with an, an unceasing faith in you. And Father, that we will testify to your goodness so others can know the hope that we have so that things that seem horrible and bad can suddenly be transformed by their beauty and the reality of your presence. Your beautiful presence as those people that were experiencing the plague all of a sudden had hope because they had the truth. Your word went forth and it healed a part of their heart. Whether their bodies were healed or not, their souls receive a touch of heaven that transformed them. You are amazing, God. You are amazing. And we declare that truth. We celebrate your grace. We receive your blessings. We need more in this world. We need an awakening. We need a revival. Jesus, we need you to destroy the devil's works even more through your church was holding up the testimony of who you are. God, we need you 
to light up this world with your presence. And we would serve you faithfully unto death and receive the crown of life. You're so good. And we declare your loving kindness is everlasting. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for joining us.